right. Hello. Good evening. Are we okay with sound? Yes. Yes. It's great to have you all here. We were going to be outside, and then I was sitting outside around 3 o'clock and decided we're not going to be outside. All the Minnesotan blood has left my body. It seems because it felt very cold. My name is Rachel Toombs. I am the Director of Formation at St. Olivet's Church. We're actually representing two Episcopal churches up here today, which is exciting. Um, and a big part of my job is to bring together smart people and hear them talk. And so that is what I've done tonight. I also teach occasionally at Baylor. I teach in the Baylor Interdisciplinary Core. And I sometimes hear students talking about things and I go, man, if I weren't your professor, I would definitely have some things to say. And so this is the platform for me to indirectly speak to my students. Um, but it actually, this whole series started with the noticing that especially young people, but not just young people, often find shortcuts or aids, maybe, to understanding who they are and what their identity is in Christ. So in the fall, we did astrology, which was a little more direct and maybe some of our critiques of it. And the feedback we got from some students and from some people is that they wanted us to see ta us tackle something that was a little more debated about the value around Christian identity. And so this March today for the spring term, um, we are asking about the Enneagram. And we have representatives here from kind of the hot, the cold, and the lukewarm. <laughs> and you get so, to guess which is yeah, which. <laughs> it'll be pretty obvious, I think, pretty quickly. But the reason that, and I'll introduce you to the panelists, the reason I chose these three women is because they are smart, they are competent, but they also have opinions and are not scared to share them. And so my hope is that this is mutual respect and enough respect that we can disagree well which is a thing a lot of people aren't good at doing these days. Um, so I'm hoping we can do it here. Uh, so let me introduce panelists. We have the newly minted rector of St. Paul's as a month ago formally, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sam Smith. So welcome, Sam, to the panel. And to Waco. So you've been here before, so yes. welcome back. Uh, another new member of the Waco community is Erin Moniz, who is the assistant <coughs> associate, I was going to get that right, a chaplain at Baylor. So she works in Bobo, the beloved Bobo, the beloved which Bobo. we all know and love. It has really nice seating during COVID times. It's really upgraded. Yeah. You didn't see it before. It used to be uncomfortable tables, and now it's like nice, fancy nice. stuff. So welcome, Erin. And finally, we have... We're bookending the lay people. We have two ordained people, and then we're bookending um, the very competent lay person, Dr. Sarah Schnicker, who is associate professor in psychology and neuroscience at Baylor. So we have people who work directly with students, people who work directly with people's souls and minds all yes. together <laughs> at one table. Yes. Yeah, so welcome. I'm excited. The way that this is going to work is I have, we had some kind of shared reading, not deep, except for, of course, Dr. Schnicker's piece, not deep, but, <laughs> but a sense of conversations around the Enneagram that we have looked at as a way to get into it, but my hope is we don't focus on those readings, but hear from y'all about your thoughts on the Enneagram, and then we will leave time at the end for questions. So if you have burning questions, Hang on to them, because we'll have an opportunity to do some question and answer. So to begin, I would like to say I am an Enneagram 5, which I don't know what that means, except for it gives me an excuse to be an introvert. So that's all I know about Enneagram 5. So I like it. Um, so I have a question for all three of you, and I know there's a range of how we identify with the Enneagram. But my question is, what's your Enneagram number if you know it? And do does it reflect well how you perceive yourself, or has it offered you any new ways to view who you are, depending on your Enneagram number? Am I starting? Yeah. Yes. Are we going directly? <laughs> okay. Let's go direct. Let's start no. obvious. Yeah. Uh, I do know my Enneagram number. I am a one, and um, I think 
Can you tell people in the room maybe who don't know what a one? Yeah, a one. Is? Yeah. Uh, I think the, I don't know the, the title. I think is the reformer. Yeah. And um, I can tell you that I am particularly concerned about moral superiority. <laughs> my like human complex um, <laughs> makes my profession wonderful. Um, I and perfectionism, right? Like that's kind of the thing that many people would know about a one. Um, I think there's a lot in the description of what a one is that I would resonate with, that would like easily bubble to the surface, and, mm -hmm. and I would say, like, yeah, that's me. And there's a lot that I am uh, like embarrassed to talk about in polite public spaces. So um, I don't know so if that let's means. Let's talk about that. Yeah. So I don't know if that means I disagree with those. You know, if it's like an incomplete characteristic of who I think I am or if it's like a little too understanding of who I am and I don't like to share those things you know yeah. I don't know but so I'm still kind of weighing that right. in my own discernment yeah. yeah wonderful um yes I'm an Enneagram 8 and for those unfamiliar with the 8s uh I think what our tell is the challenger <laughs> It's great. It's really just an attractive moniker for that. Um, but uh, there's parts of the descriptions that are more and sometimes less uh, associated with me just as an individual. But I would say that um, the core motivation is what really, really signaled for me that this was probably my number. And, um, and a lot about the Enneagram starts with identifying what motivates us, not necessarily behaviors. And so that was helpful because I really hated personality tests. I actually kind of still do. Um, and part of that was because you had to sort of be intuitive to do them, like questions that say, would you rather this or this? And I'm like, I don't, I don't know, <laughs> I don't really know. And so with the Enneagram, reading about the different numbers and recognizing myself in the eight was really helpful because it was a different approach to this sort of intuitive process instead of relying on what I already knew about myself, giving that language. So that core motivation is um, not wanting to be controlled. And control is a big thing for Enneagram AIDS. And it's not that we have to control everything, we just don't want to be controlled. And that sort of scratches down to the, the surface of, of, of sort of how my framework for the, for the world and how I work. So there's behaviors that some I, I go well with, uh, sometimes perceived as aggressive or loud or you know not afraid of conflict and and then speak up and speak out um but uh but there's there's also caricatures and stereotypes associated with each number and so i, I would i would sort of pull back on some of that but uh for me the, it has been helpful and i'm, I'm gonna probably think represent the pro mm -hmm. stance on this <laughs> on this one um but but with some caveats so we can get more into that into that later that's that's my story so yes, I'm left as the con, <laughs> um, and so it's, I really can't answer this question. Yeah. Um, I know when Rachel sent out, I'm like, ah, uh, <laughs> we're gonna know who what my position is. It's um, I so just so all you know, like my training is in personality psychology. Mm -hmm. So I do personality science. There aren't there's this field of personality and social psychology that are kind of together and the personality part is like what makes each person unique or studying individual differences whereas the social component is how do situations affect us and what makes us all the same as a human species mm -hmm. um there's a lot of social psychologists in the world there's actually not that many of the personality folks still out there mm -hmm. um and so it's the types when I look at them from that perspective are somewhat incoherent because I'm like, those two things don't go together. This doesn't like, and so, and I've tried to take some of the tests or think about it and um, I, I cannot actually, I looked at it again this week. I'm like, okay, I've had five that could work well for me. <laughs> um, and part of that I think is humans, our personalities, when you look at modern personality theory, it's not just a type, it's person and their role in a particular context. And there's different ways we think about it. Um, so yes, it is actually very hard for me to actually even answer. <laughs> How many of you in the room have done Enneagram? Wow, the majority. How many of you would say it mostly reflects you well who have done it? How many of you would say absolutely not? 
right, we've got a, li a little absolutely not a whole lot of pretty well. And sir, you make a good point for anyone who hasn't done the Enneagram. The Enneagram is different in that it's not like you answer a bunch of questions and then output, but you have to find yourself mm -hmm. in it. And there's, there's these various entries, which is both nice, because you aren't being pigeonholed, but also it's self-selective, mm -hmm. right? And that's part of the question here is, how are we perceived and the things that we like? And then what are things we read that we don't want to be us? And so we go, right? Like, I like being a five. I don't know what the five is. It's like the, <laughs> the, thinker. Might know. It's the thinker in your head. Like, I like it just because it gives me an excuse to be in my head which maybe is not, you know, virtuous. But <laughs> anyway, all right, so thank you. And yeah, we have some questions, but I imagine we might get to some of the writing Sarah has done sooner than later, which is fine. We don't have to go, there's no order to this. Um, but let's begin, as I think it's really helpful to begin in these conversations, and that is going to students. And so often when I think about this stuff, I go to the Baylor Lariat. Those of you who don't know, it's the student newspaper. They do a lot of writing, and actually one of the editors is an Episcopalian student, which is ah, pretty cool. wonderful. We're pretty good at a Baptist yeah, institution. I know, it's like we're representing. We're um, up in the world. Yeah. Uh, but I go there and I, just to get a sense of the common student, because usually the editorials represent, not always, but often, more than one student. And there was an article from last year, I believe, on the Enneagram, and for those of you who also don't know, and Aaron might be able to speak to this more, Baylor is very gung-ho about the Enneagram. They do a lot of stuff around spiritual life formation. They even have workshops. I know pre-COVID it was really strong. I don't know if it's the same level, I don't know if you know, of strength now, but it's something that's really valued. And I read this article, and the writer, she says, which I find helpful, that the Enneagram has been helpful not only for her to understand herself, but those around her. And so she writes, quote, to me, the test gives you much more than just a number. The results and descriptions of the personality type helps to provide some context text as to why people act the way they do. And so it's not just her understanding herself, and I've imagined this is where some of the greatest benefit and pitfalls of the Enneagram is, is also how you relate to others. And as a married person, I am married to an eight. And I looked up like what it said about my marriage and I'm kind of like, well, sure, but why not can it fit? It didn't feel super on point of the work we've done in our marriage to get us to this point. Maybe some of the initial stuff, but it's used a lot in these relationships. And I know students who say, well, I wouldn't date that person because they're a blank. Mm. That's a real thing. Mm. I'm not, I'm glad, there's, it's a real thing. Yes. And so this understanding of others. So with that, have you found the Enneagram helpful in understanding the needs of others? Not only your own motivations, but what others might be motivated by or seeking. And this can go to anyone. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say that for my my own personal journey, the Enneagram has been helpful. In fact, it's been one of the only sort of personality type quizzes that has been helpful, particularly because I struggle with my own ability to be intuitive. And because of that, having something that creates some language that can reflect back, that can help me um, create some understanding around, you know, how I think or how I, how I communicate and how I'm motivated uh, was extremely helpful. And I've definitely used uh, it in workshops. I, I used to have a, a group of students who worked for me at, at the former institution I worked at, and we used um, the Enneagram as a way to create some level of self-awareness. But the Enneagram has its limits and its dangers. And, and I, I, I don't want to get too much into Sarah's territory because she speaks well to this, I think, but I'll bring up just some other side points from my own perspective, which is um, in one sense, 
which is ironic for this panel. The Enneagram has recently been commandeered by white evangelical women um, yeah. on Instagram. <laughs> I think we just need to put that out there. Um, and there's a culture created around that from which a lot of these problems emerge, particularly uh, fatalism, um, mm -hmm. diagnosing, uh, using, using it prescriptively. Um, in some ways, it also functions like a Christian horoscope. And so in all of these ways, I believe that some of the some of the ways we have taken and enculturated this, particularly in that vein, have sprung some of these problems. Another problem that, that I, I feel we need to put on the table tonight is the issue of race. Um, when I was creating these workshops for my students, one of my black students came and talked to me and he sat me down and he says, I see what you're trying to do, boss, but black people do not do this. And I hit the pause button and had to go back and do some work and figure out whether or not I was imposing some sort of normative white culture onto my students of color, which is, is another factor in this that I think we need to consider. So while it has been helpful, and while it has also been helpful to my students, in fact, it's ironic, I've had like three or four conversations just this week with former students that it came up on their own how much the Enneagram has helped them and why it has helped them, particularly from a student who is skeptical about the Enneagram and struggled to find her number. And I like to tell my students, I don't need you to find your number necessarily in the workshops I created. I said, I don't need you to find your number, but I would love for you to be able to answer these questions and think about what happens when I'm stressed or how do I contribute to a team? And so for my students who, again, are younger or starting to learn about themselves, are starting to think this way, the Enneagram provided a tool by which they could begin to at least articulate those things, which were, were good for like my team working together. And so in that way, I think the Enneagram is useful, but as, as I am the pro on this, I don't wanna be too consuming. <laughs> I, I have benefited greatly from the Enneagram. I use it prolifically in different areas, yeah. but with the caution that there are a lot of things about it we need to be particularly aware of, especially in faith environments, especially in white dominant environments. Well, I wonder, um, the comment about, right, white women, right, I think one of my concerns, and I, some of my concerns are not just to the Enneagram, right, it's also to the Myers-Briggs, mm -hmm. and also there's a variety of popular personality typologies mm -hmm. that do not have scientific merit, even though they sometimes pretend they do, and really are based on a typology versus a dimensional approach mm -hmm. and a contextualized approach to a human being, mm -hmm. right? So that's, right, the Enneagram just happens to be the most popular one at the moment, and especially in religious circles, right? And so, and I think, when you're talking, it clicked for me too that one of the main issues with typologies, when you said you're this type of person, this type of person, or this type of person, instead of saying like, on this dimension, you're a little high, on this dimension, it's this, when this happens, you do this, like much more complex, but accurate. Um, I think the problem with typologies is they push people to move towards what we call the fundamental attribution error in social psychology, so this is, the human bias of almost all people, especially in the West though, where we look at other people's behavior and instead of recognizing all the things in their context and their environment that pushed them to do that thing, we say it's about them. It's something internal to them. They're a good person, they're a bad person. Why did they act in a racist way? They are a racist, right? So we have a bias to already look at other people's behavior and say, because of them, <laughs> yeah. instead of saying, well, most people would do that in that kind of pressures. And I think, especially white America has that bias because we have these privileges. And so I, I imagine that there are certain groups who are not as attracted to it because it explains behavior by these ter personality types mm -hmm. instead of saying, actually, there's systemic things that have led me to be successful or Am I naturally reformer? No, it's that I'm, I cannot ignore injustice in my life. Um, so I think that is, and that relates to my other concerns about them. It's stereotype, like I think that, and it's not just the Enneagram, it's all these typologies. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the thing that makes me most nervous about the Enneagram is that people say it's spiritual. Mm -hmm. 
Whereas Myers-Briggs, we just called it personality, right. Um, right? But now we're saying, this is, God did this, <laughs> or right? And whenever you lay spirituality on something, it just makes it more potent in both the good and bad. So when you throw spirituality on something really good, it just makes it even better. But that's why you see like, church, like Christian, in all of history, the worst things in the world were often the church involved, as were the best. So that's, I think, where I get especially concerned with the Enneagram, is that it's then become spiritualized. Um, um, I, my first thing is, I think uh, Baylor particularly has like a long history of um, wanting to help young people articulate kind of this emerging self-awareness right like mm -hmm. when i was a, i graduated in 2009 from baylor and when i came in in the fall of 2005 everyone who was admitted had to take the strikes finder mm -hmm. yeah and uh when you moved into the dorm your little name thing on the dorm had your strengths <laughs> and your roommate strengths and um which is you know great at the time but but I think what that does, and I think what the Enneagram does in, in this context particularly is kind of like an emergent adult, is this idea of like a shared language, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Um, because we can be working on very different assumptions if we're not careful and trying to say the same thing, right? Like we're trying to talk about the same thing, but we're coming from two totally yeah. different contexts where we haven't talked about them the same way. And so relationally, I find value in just creating that kind of vocabulary, mm -hmm. right? For all its goods and for all its ills, that we have some kind of framework by which we can start to engage ourselves and mm -hmm. one another in hopefully constructive, healthy ways. Yes. I think the, the danger of that, right, as we kind of creep into the spirituality piece is um, idolatry. Mm -hmm. It's like letting the thing, the test, the assessment, the instrument become that which we attain, you know, hope to attain, yeah. um, rather than this kind of deeper self-awareness of the beautiful mm -hmm. yeah. image of God that is within each of us, yes. right? Mm -hmm. um, so as the neutral voice, you know, <laughs> pros and cons, but um, I think that shared language is, is just so important when you're 18, 19, 20, right. when you're 35 and you just had your first kid and you and your husband are trying to figure out what it means to be a family of three, like, all of the transitions in life, particularly, those liminal spaces where there is a change, I think having that foundation of shared vocabulary can be so important to safe discovery, mm -hmm. right, and safe exploration. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we haven't talked about the wings yet, but I was thinking about the wings. Does anyone, everyone know the wings? The wings yeah. are interesting, <laughs> especially for the eights, being married to an eight, mm -hmm. because either there's like the bad eight or the good eight. Maybe I'm over characterizing. But basically, it's like it's like it's like the eight who cares about people, and then the eight who doesn't care about people. Right? Basically, it's like the hot and cold or something. Of, and I feel like the wings are an attempt to add some nuance, so that it's less of a typology. So that's basically like a choose your own adventure kind of. Which yeah. kind are you? Which I is interesting because in Strength Finders you don't get that. No, it's very. Yeah. I was in youth ministry and they made me take the Strength Finder, and it made it sound like I should be the last person working with people because all my strengths <laughs> were like. Uh, and, I, and I remember being really discouraged by it. So I'm like, well, I guess that's who I am on this sheet of paper. Anyway, I feel very bitter about Strength Finders. <laughs> um, I'm glad we are not as typed here yeah. in our pro con and middle. Um, I think we've hit on the danger lurking, and we're going to get back to that. Um, I think we've the idea of shared language as there's benefit to that. Mm -hmm. And I think about being 19 is a really difficult time. You're figuring mm -hmm. out what you even care about, what you want. I was talking yesterday to a freshman trying to choose her major. She's like, how am I supposed to do that? Like, I don't, I'll do whatever. <laughs> like, that was her it's, So that really tracks, I think, for mm -hmm. especially young people, but not just those that are in wandering vocational calls and know mm -hmm. that feeling well. It, it keeps on going. Um, so moving on, I want to get to Sarah's article. So we're leading up there. Um, so the Enneagram has found traction in the realm of business and spirituality, which 
you're right, that's a rare combination that you find it really strongly in both. Um, by the way, did any of you working in churches or in youth group have to choose if you were the lion? You guys remember yep. these things? Mm -hmm. Like the lion, the, the golden retriever, golden retriever, otter. otter. And, anyway, yeah, we just love doing this. Sorry, I just yeah. thought of that. I'm like, we always love doing this. Oh my gosh, this. so many. Um, You're big into the color. The yes, the color, color, green, 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 blue. Yeah, which yeah, color? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go back to the Greeks, the phlegmatic, melancholic. Yeah, yeah. they're gonna. Yeah, the different. Disc. We just yes. love. We love type of categorizing. Yeah. Love it. Anyway, so this is not the Enneagram's fault. I'll no. say. We love doing this. <laughs> but the Enneagram has found tons of traction, and mostly by traction, I mean dollar signs, mm -hmm. in the realm of business and spirituality, including some very high-selling spiritual books on the Enneagram. I forget the most popular one, but there's one that Richard Rohr. Yeah. No, there's, there's a Richard Rohr one, and then there's another the one. Road back to you. The Road Back to You. Yeah, yeah it's a very nice cover. Um, I appreciate a good cover. Um, so the Enneagram has a broad apl applicability in ways we don't see with Myers-Briggs or with Strength Finders. In a place like Waco, in a university like Baylor, the Enneagram serves as part of the spiritual formation curriculums um, helping students and parishioners grow not only into better versions of themselves or better friends to others, but becoming more Christ-like. There are churches in town, as someone who heads up formation at a church, I sometimes look at what other churches are doing, and there are churches that one of their main formation tools mm -hmm. is Enneagram workshops. Mm -hmm. Not at St. Albans. I don't think it's St. Paul's, but there are some churches in town. No, if no, you do it, it's, yeah. all, it's all good. No judgment. Um, if you try, I'm going to come... Yeah, Sarah's been after yeah. 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 That's from my second year of it. Yeah, that's when you really do. You start rolling out the five year plan. Yeah. 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 So, Relevant Magazine, I don't know if you all know Relevant. It's kind of like the cool, hip, evangelical um, magazine. It's got really nice, like, covers. Anyway, it's very cool. The covers. We're um, back to the cool. Back I know. I yeah. clearly cool think covers, yeah. I like a good cover. Um, so, it's, it calls itself a Christian lifestyle magazine. And it published an article a few years back called How the Enneagram Can Point You to God. Those of you who are cringy, be prepared. This will make you cringe maybe a little. But a therapist and a writer, so a trained therapist and a writer, she writes in the article about how the Enneagram, and this is some of what we've been talking about, helps us delve below the surface to inter interrogate our motivations and will in order to show the ways that we are captive to sin and how to be free from it, basically how to be liberated by God through our reflection in the Enneagram. And she writes, quote, the Enneagram makes sanctification specific by giving us a roadmap to where we most need God's healing. So one more time. The Enneagram makes sanctification specific by giving us a roadmap, pointing to the roadmap back to you, to where we most need God's healing. So this is clearly spiritualizing mm -hmm. the Enneagram. So first, have you found the Enneagram helpful in your own life or in the lives of others in terms of the hard work of recognizing our waywardness and opening up to the transformative power of God's mercy? So have you seen it be an effective tool? I'll say, so, um, all right, we've been mentioning this article, right? So it was in Christianity Today in January, was that this year, last year? I don't know when it was. It was last year. Um, and so just, I thought it was important, so it was actually three of us were authors. So Jay Medenwalt, who's in the back, who's a grad student in my lab, um, who kind of shares my position. But then we also had um, another person, a full-time staff person in my lab, Lizzie Davis, who really likes it and embraces it because I thought it was important we do a fair, <laughs> um, be able to have someone who actually likes it put their name on it would indicate it's fair. Um, and I think, and when you were speaking earlier, the Enneagram, like they have some of the best discussion questions, <laughs> right? I think these Enneagram curricula, like these are great discussion questions. I'm like, let's just separate it from the Enneagram system and just, do it like yeah. around like some of what we do know about personality and some of it you don't necessarily even need a typology like these are just really good questions so in that regard I want to say like they're doing some of the best discussion questions that are out there which is interesting um, and it's interesting to wonder why that's happening there and not some of our other curriculum and spiritual formation tools um, 
So I think that is a real benefit. Um, but then, right, my big tip, if it's not actually accurate, <laughs> um, is that really helping you discern where you need growth? Yeah. Um, and I think my other, I'm like, and maybe, right, this is me as a psych. I mean, I've always thought as a psychologist, I think even before I was one, I'm like, isn't it obvious where you're having trouble a lot? Like, <laughs> I'm like, I always find other people let me know where I need to grow and don't they actually have, yeah. like, it's like, if I'm in actual relationships with people and actually participating in a church, we're going to have conflict. Like, so, but I think though, what it, I think the shared language feature and I do, I appreciate that it normalizes that everyone is growing. Mm -hmm. So that's a benefit that I think is really good and that our growth might look different. Yeah. Right, so my husband's here. Um, tell him you don't have to come, but he came for this one. Um, I mean, it's interesting. I know in our marriage, like we have conversations, just vision, like what is my relationship with God look like? Mm -hmm. And we realized, I mean, early on, his was much more combative with God. <laughs> They're fighting, like the story of, like, Jacob's ladder, right? That's whereas mine, I'm like, my relationship with God is like floating on a pool, and I just have to calm down so God can carry me instead of <laughs> trying to do it. Like, yeah. those are very different views yeah. of what each of our spiritual journeys is going to look okay. like. Um, so I think that is a really good thing. I think oftentimes in religious groups, there's kind of like, this is the ideal way. Like, this yeah. is the way some everyone's spiritual growth should be going. Um, and so I like that it normalizes. Yeah. There's individual differences, but I think it can get dangerous if it starts to say this is some magic solution. Like, mm -hmm. that there's a special knowledge you can get here that you can't get. Yeah. <laughs> from just your relationships and having community. good communication yeah. and Christian community. I think that, and then, right, and then my contention about, like, it's not actually accurate, so it might actually be leading you the wrong way. Mm -hmm. um, and I can bring this up later some more, but I also, I'm concerned as a psychologist, focusing too much on just correcting sin or fixing yeah. your weaknesses might actually be counterproductive in terms of, Sanctification. Like, we have a lot of research that sometimes when you try too hard to fix something directly, we call it the ironic effects of self control, you actually have more of that behavior <laughs> when you're under stress and we're all under stress. So, there's also of like, what should our focus be? Should it be on our own sin or should it be on God's narrative and God's story in our life? Like, I think that's. A so, piece that they emphasize yeah. that I'm not sure is yeah. why. So not just in terms of self improvement, which you know I need to improve these. It kind of implies the weak spots, but in terms of the word sanctification, what actually I'm is looking, I'm looking at our yes, yeah, so people who actually can answer that. Me, what actually is the work of sanctification, and how does Enneagram fit or not fit in that work? I mean. My view on it is is um, purely based on confession. Yeah. Right. Um, we have no con control over our like we don't sit on the judgment seat. Yeah. Right. As Christians, we believe we don't sit on the judgment seat, and so um, if we can get to a place where we can be self-aware enough to confess that's it that's the labor that's the continuous work of um constantly falling before god and and burying ourselves and being broken open right that kind of scriptural image of being broken open on a rock and um that's what i appreciate about the enneagram in a way because this whole like idea of measuring motivation or like getting underneath, right? I'm a preaching coach. I'm a preaching yeah. mentor and I preach, I, I coach preachers kind of across denominations. And one of the things we talk a lot about is the human condition. Like how do you get to the human, what makes a, a sermon meaningful and impactful? And, and part of the equation is the human condition. And part of that work is, is constantly asking 
why? What's below that? What's below that action or that behavior, right? And often it whittles down to that thing, that universal thing, which currently often is fear, right? But it takes a lot of work to get there. And so there's this work in the Enneagram about like, what are you afraid of? What is your greatest fear? Mine is being bad. Mm -hmm. Not being wrong, being bad. Says a lot about my profession probably <laughs> and my vocation. But, but I think that's real, it's for me, if I can't get back to that and say like, what am I over controlling and over programming and over correcting because I am fearful? If I can't get back to that, I, yeah. why do I care about sanctification? Like I can't, yeah. we've, we've got to do the breaking open part first. So really quick, you talked about being a one and there being parts of the one that either feel not right or too close to home. Mm -hmm. So in those moments, how is that tied in with the work of confession? Like, what, what do you do with those moments when you read a description you're like, ooh, either that's not me or I don't like that very much? Um, yeah, that's a moment of prayer for me yeah. and, like, deep contemplation of, like, I, this is not mine alone to carry anymore. Yeah. I've got to turn this over because yeah. it is making me too uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. So basically, you recognize it gives you an opportunity to enter into prayer. So yeah. the mm -hmm. idea of roadmap might not be the worst kind of description of how the enemy right. But I also like have no um, no design to say in any way that I get to choose that for myself, yeah. right? Like I don't get to just draw my roadmap and be like, X marks the spot, Jesus. Like, come on, let's go. You know, it's yeah. it's really a a like companioned adventure yeah. with God, right? To kind of grow deeper and deeper into yeah. that work of self knowledge yeah. and and confession okay. and yeah. yeah so those really quick for those who don't know the anglican episcopal tradition it is built into our daily prayers to confess multiple times a day if we kind of are like the all-star ones yeah. of our daily <laughs> office. Um, yeah. um, yeah. That's in, not bad. and you never you never reach a point where you're like oh i can skip over that part mm -hmm. like confession and absolution easter you can skip Easter, over Easter. For a season. <laughs> but maybe you shouldn't go the whole season. But maybe, yeah, just yeah, a day. Yeah, just maybe a day. day. Maybe yeah. Yeah. Easter Sunday, cool. But Monday morning. As you better be confessing. That's but that right. does say if there, there is a roadmap, in some ways our roadmap is circular, right? Yeah, because right. we keep on. Yeah. There's never a point when we get beyond the work you're talking yeah. about. Right. Good. Yeah. yeah, just I think taking anything like the Enneagram and fully baptizing it or fully exercising it is are both extremes that need to be avoided because this is this is an extra biblical tool that can be used for good or evil and and I think for our students uh, to cling to something that seems to work you just want to make it fit into every piece of your life and then we get into trouble I, I don't think any of this work should be done without community mm -hmm. so whether it's the Enneagram or any level of self-discovery and that I think is going to push back on some of those misuses as we see it worked out in relationship as we're doing that self-discovery. Talk, talk about the good eight and the bad eight. <laughs> so in the Enneagram, it, it's this, you can be your number in a very unhealthy way, or you can be your number in a healthy way. And so there is sort of this track of trying to work your number for its best and being your best, which would ultimately affect your ability to be healthy in relationship versus unhealthy where you're unhealthy for yourself and relationship. So I can see why people pull that with sanctification and pull that with like this transformative process. It feels like an easy, mm -hmm. easy thing to tie together. For me, I, I'm, I'm wary of that because like in some ways that is, can be helpful or there can be ways to, to sort of overlap that. I found the Enneagram most practical in pragmatics. Mm -hmm. um, for, for myself as a leader, for someone who uh, is responsible for employees, um, I was I was recently in an interview process, um, and it went well. Uh, yeah, it's, you know, <laughs> well, thumbs up. But uh, there's a questions about uh, your leadership style. What is your leadership style? And my answer to this question is always, I don't think that's a thing. Like I I can tell you that being so like being a typical eight. I tend to be full, full, you know, engines running, 
drilling ahead can easily just roll right over people. I can be insensitive. I can be obtuse to the, the, thing, the signals people are giving me around me. I can be very driven. I can be very matter of fact. That is my style. That is not good. <laughs> Always for people. Do I get a lot done? Yeah. Am, am I fairly pragmatic? Yeah. There's, there's aspects of this that make me really good at my job, but my leadership style is in the question. My question is, do I understand how to contribute to healthy or toxic environments? Mm -hmm. And so as a leader, am I thinking about how there are parts of my style that need to be reined in, that need to be curbed? So what the Enneagram has helped me do is think like, what are those parts of me? What are those parts of me that are not great for the people around me? And that's helped give me language. Is again, not a very intuitive person. So I'm not necessarily going to discover that for myself. The Enneagram has been helpful. In another way, when I was a supervisor to student workers, uh, true story, it's, it's hard to judge things on behaviors because behaviors can come from multiple motivations. And this is, again, where the Enneagram helped me out. I've got two different students. They're both pushing back on a directive I've given them. One identifies as a six and one identifies as an eight. My response to them is different based on what I know about them because the eight is pushing back because they're feeling controlled. And the six is pushing back because they're testing whether or not they can trust me. If I respond similarly to both behaviors and overlook what that student is actually trying to do, even without them necessarily having the wherewithal to articulate that to me, mm -hmm. knowing that about them because of the work we've done with the Enneagram helped me lead and shift differently to respond to those mm -hmm. students. So that's that's kind of why I stay pro on the Enneagram, just because I've in situations like that, I've just seen it um, just reap good rewards. But again, these are these are pragmatic. So my husband and I would do a lot of premarital counseling. We work with college students, they are always always, always getting married. Um, so we do a lot of premarital counseling. And in one sense, there's a pragmatism to learning how to bring two lives together about deciding who's going to take out the trash and how to communicate and figure out holidays. Those are great and those are good, but they're not the theology of intimacy. They're not the theology of marriage. They're not this, there's a whole vein of how scripture informs us about this, this holy thing that is happening when we come into intimate relationship with other people. Um, and so I think for me, that's sort of how I think about the Enneagram is there are places it just cannot go because it is extra biblical, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't have a, a place to live in helping us be better people, but that doesn't necessarily make it a roadmap for sanctification. It just might be a, a piece of the self-awareness and articulation that helps us particularly in relationship with each other and ourselves. And then I think the Lord can use that mm -hmm. effectively, but we gotta be careful because idolatry is sneaky and we make a good thing, an ultimate thing. And the next thing we know, we're, we're being predictive about ourselves and, um, and that's dangerous. And I think for all the reasons we've seen the Enneagram, and this goes back to some of the examples in your article, it's been misused in egregious ways. And so we just have to be, we have to be careful. And to give, for people who haven't read the article, um, yeah. <laughs> um, so we, um, we wanted to kind of flesh out what this actually looks like in real human beings when it goes well yeah. and when it doesn't. And so we told stories of two real couples, um, one who hopefully were probably mentored with someone like you for their <laughs> Enneagram, introduced it to them in premarital counseling. It really helped their marriage. It gave them a language. It um, was very pragmatic. They're both growing, like major success. They say that was really helpful during those early years. Um, but we also talked to another couple, um, well, no longer a couple. Um, the woman, her and her husband were kind of having marital issues. He started the Enneagram was introduced to them. He started reading about it and decided they needed to get divorced because their types weren't compatible and this is just who he was and this wasn't gonna work. Um, and that's like when I hear students of like, I can't date that. Like, yeah. and those are the ones, warning. big warning. Um, 
especially then, right, as someone who's like, and it's not even really accurate. Like, <laughs> I'm like, you're making this based off something that doesn't actually represent personality well. Um, and becoming, and I think in those kind of usages too, it's it's becoming the idol or the crop. Like, it's allowing them to abdicate to Kate, certain responsibilities and like, oh, this is just who I am. <laughs> uh, instead of saying like, but we're all called to live in community. Well, like everyone, it, it's also what I see in a lot of the marriage literature from certain, from a lot of Christian groups, like the class that's like men are from Mars, women are from Venus. <laughs> like this is the way men act and this is the way women act, which there are some group differences, <laughs> but we also know those are not just intrinsic, those are also based on culture and socialization and the environment you are, like that all humans can be, can develop their listening skills. All humans can increase in their love, willingness to love. Stick all, around for the gender theology. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> all humans can be kind and giving feedback. Like, right, there's these, right, and I always, and even that one, I'm like, there actually is some real legitimacy to some of the patterns they uncover mm -hmm. that we see even at a physiological level. But what, like, so what, so you have this pattern of human behavior, right? We also know men are more likely to cheat because of evolutionary psychology. Like, we have all kinds of things mm -hmm. of who we are and who God has made us, but that doesn't, that doesn't constrain us of what we should be trying to become and how God changes us. Um, and the other thing I would say too is that there actually is quite, uh, there's more personality change across the life course than I think um, is recognized, um, especially when you measure personality at the right level. So, and when you see those changes in particular, when people take on new roles, mm -hmm. becoming a parent, right? There's these, right, changes, can happen in context. And even when you're talking about like, what is your biggest fear? Like, I can't actually nail one down because it has changed. Yeah. I mean, what your biggest fear is also depends on what maybe you're lacking or what feels least secure in your life. Um, that these are really dynamic human processes. Um, and that's just more difficult, but, right? I think, right, when they're using the Enneagram as this tool to like make it easy to understand, like, like a paradigm for the world, a paradigm for the world. And even a paradigm on like in fine with it of a language, like if we say it's not actually descriptive of the whole person, it's really just a tool to help us get along in a yeah. group. It's like Scallop Strength Finder, I take less issue with because they've never made claims about this is who you all you are. They like limit it to the workplace setting mm -hmm. and keep it. These are just your workplace strengths. Yeah. I'm not going to say you're big fundamental of who you are and what human beings are, um, even though they have issues as well. But right, I think that's, we just to be so careful. Um, and it's easier to go that route, like, well, right, and being a personality researcher, oh my good, like I talk to like other harder sciences, I'm like, your job's easy, because you have one thing, like your measurement, like, you what may well, you weigh it you <laughs> like you have some measurement error but you just it's not like that's our hard job is what is the phenomenon how much is stable and how do you capture it and it's incredibly complex i wondered i don't know if both of you got to read the co-written mm -hmm. credit where credit's due um article in christianity today but did you have any thoughts reading through it anything that stuck out as you read that made you either see the Enneagram in a new way or just that was like, well, that's an interesting point I haven't thought of. Um, I come from a hard science background. Mm -hmm. I have two degrees in hard science I, and I hate it. <laughs> um, um, and I was surprised that like my kind of my response was like, so what if it's not accurate mm -hmm. right I was like which shocked me because <laughs> I would hope that I would want it to be accurate um but I what I really kind of dug out of it was um in all things accurate or not scientifically measurable or not 
um, I think we have a propensity, one, to, to categorize and systemize, right? Like we kind of alluded yeah. to that earlier. Um, but once we do that to then two, like retreat into a defensive posture of that, like to kind of dig in, right? The man who said, well, I'm a seven and we're not compatible. Like that's a, that's a crutch. Yeah. Like, bro, you don't want to do the hard work. So you're just, we're just not compatible, you know? Um, and I think there's, that's the danger is like, you know, it's sneaky. Like you think you're like idolatry, like you think you're going along, being a productive human and trying to grow and, and, and be a good community member and a family member and whatever. And all of a sudden, like your back's up against a wall and your spouse is over there and your kids are upstairs or in the backyard and everyone's yelling at each other. And you're like, how did we get here? Right. Or you could like take that out to the wider community, to the neighborhood, to a college campus, to a church. Mm -hmm. um, and it's because like, I think we just want that safety blanket of like, I know who I am. This is who, like when everything about you is being questioned, like just this, mm -hmm. you know, rope of hope. Like maybe I can still articulate something meaningful about my existence. Um, and so I just, that's what I was wrestling with as I read your article was like, what does this mean for us really like on the ground is if it's, measurable if it's not any yeah. tool we use what are we doing with it and why and mm -hmm. um what supersedes that mm -hmm. like what gets us beyond those barriers and that's where i think kind of the christian community is so important and what i love about um our traditions is that we we sit in churches um where we don't always agree with each other, but we pass the peace, mm -hmm. right? And we say our confessions together and we pray for one another and we share a meal. Mm -hmm. And that's the, it just, that's what keeps me grounded, right? That kind of ties, ties us back when we retreat into our corners of um, like identity and labels and security. So that's kind of, that was my, I reread it in the car as I was sitting out in the street and I was like, Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. Yes. No. So. Well, and I think it's so interesting too, by labeling yourself as a type set, that actually might indeed make it harder to be compatible. Yeah. <laughs> right. Because the way we process social and all information, but social especially is once we have a schema, right? Like once we have an idea of what this thing is, we don't even notice anything that is different. Yeah. Right. We just, if you imagine, like, think about how much social information you get every day, <laughs> like, constant, like, slight mm -hmm. eye movement, like, all the, like, all this body language, all these different things, and you just, it actually, indeed, might make you less compatible because you're now only processing things according to this way of thinking about yourself mm -hmm. that isn't very compatible, instead of saying, I can, I'm not one way. Yeah. yeah. And I, I would agree. I, I've never experienced the Enneagram that way, but mm -hmm. I have met people for whom that is absolutely the way they're doing it. And so that's, mm -hmm. that's why uh, to, to give, to give it to do, to say that mm -hmm. this is actually happening and we need to be aware of it. And these warnings are sound. And I, I, mm -hmm. I definitely co-sign on that. Um, I found out through being an Enneagram eight that it doesn't give me an excuse to be insensitive to people. But it does help me realize that I might be more insensitive to people than I ever realized. Mm -hmm. And and I truly didn't realize. And there are things that, that came up in that process of self-discovery that allowed me to go, oh, you know, this is this is a part of the way I see the world. And this is part of the way that I think and understand. And, and in terms of who I want to be and how I want to learn and how I want to, to, to be different in these spaces that I occupy, what is this telling me? that can be useful to me, that can be helpful to me. And then I guess there's also an ulterior motive of learning it because it is the language of so many of our students. Right. And I wanna be able to speak um, intelligibly with them when they come in and they're like, I'm a three, let's talk about this. And, and, and want to use that like shared language to yeah. to understand these be things. fluent in the context, right? Right, right. right. Yeah. Um, but I would, yeah, I was reading your article and I thought, man, I would never dream of trying to use this like a, like a, a human science. Like yeah. never would I dream of trying to use the Enneagram the way like we understand like social psychology, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so thinking about it from that way and thinking, gosh, but knowing 
that there's a lot of that out there. Yeah. And knowing that that's... Well, that makes money. Exa right. Exactly. Right. I think yeah. that's, exactly. I mean, that's, that's yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. That's what... And, and in the same way that my, that my student of color gave me pause and, and forced me to sort of pull back and hit the pause button on the mm -hmm. way I applied the Enneagram for my students, I think as long as we're, we're open to hitting that pause button and saying, is this helpful or harmful yeah. mm -hmm. to myself, to others? Then it can be useful. That it can be that, like a good thing. That um, that I I was really thinking hard about this because I think we should always be ready to be wrong mm -hmm. about our, our stances on things. Mm -hmm. And so I, I will say I've been thinking deeply about this, getting ready for this panel. And the thing that keeps sticking out in my mind is just all of the people I've seen it help. Mm -hmm. All of the people who've had good experiences. All of the people that I've seen that. They have found a way to use it in a beneficial way that doesn't step into these dangerous spaces. And so as long as I keep seeing that, hopefully I'm contributing to that pattern of goodness mm -hmm. with this tool as simply a tool. Um, that is my, I think I'm going to, I'm going to stay there until, until other, uh, proven otherwise. Mm -hmm. But, but knowing that I've also seen it be used very, very poorly and so we try to lead in a way that mm -hmm. pulls away from that and to never try to think of it as a human science. So like my students learn the Enneagram and take Sarah's class. <laughs> <laughs> and then they're like, <laughs> <laughs> learn, Wait, learn yourself from 360 yeah. degrees. Mm -hmm. And then, and then like, let's go and, and confess in our corporate mm -hmm. settings mm -hmm. and learn what the Lord is doing and put these things in their proper place. So, thesis statement, because we're all kind of nerds at this table. Our thesis statement is that the Enneagram may be a helpful tool, so long as it's not confused with psychology or spirituality in and of itself. So maybe it's about right use, proper use, mm -hmm. and knowing what it is and is not, because it is not sanctification, and it is not Telling you personality. I mean, yeah, yeah. but even it just doesn't like it's inac. It does yeah. not describe personality very yeah. well in the way it actually exists in people. Yeah. Well, personalities are dynamic. They're and if, static, if so that, that can right, actually, nothing. Yeah. You have to have a dynamic method, which yes. we do. Have. Which we do. I was going to say, and if that is what we want, there are theories that right. do help us, but they're much more complex and nowhere near as convenient as a number that can be posted on TikTok every day. Right. That's right. That's Instagram so posts, yeah, graphics. Yeah. yeah, all of the. They're so beautiful. They're so pretty. Yeah. Here's the interesting. So this is just an aside. When we did astrology, there were tons of social influencers on TikTok. Looking at Enneagram, more of them are on Instagram. Instagram. Isn't that fascinating that even the social media outlet where the influencers are? Anyway, I find that hmm. I don't really know what to do that because I don't understand social media, but it is interesting. <laughs> That I don't know if that's generational or just the media of Enneagram is beautiful and mm -hmm. phrases it's work very better. Visually. TikTok yeah. is more dynamic. And so anyway, that's just a note. I want to leave time for y'all. So I'm going to repeat your questions so that the recording can have them on record. Um, but do we have any questions from y'all? Yes, John. I'll do. Um, I think all three of you mentioned community as a big aspect of this path of self-discovery. Um, and in this time after, well, after the big part of COVID, right? <laughs> as we're rebuilding community, and I see this a lot as a high school teacher, how do we have these conversations in these new forms or in these smaller forms of community that we have in this? Most yeah. initial COVID work. I call it the COVID denouement. <laughs> <laughs> it's the, hopefully it yes. is truly the, the yeah. falling narrative yeah. art. Yeah. So how we are in a moment, a strange moment, where we're returning mm -hmm. to one another in rooms. This would have been spectacular a little while ago, us mm -hmm. all being in a room together. Mm -hmm. How in this moment of returning to a new sense of community do we take some of this insight about the Enneagram going forward? I think one really important thing, um, you see people really grow in community when there's a commitment to stick with the community. So you'll see in our culture in the United States, especially white culture, but a variety of different subcultures, 
right? A lot of times friendships are very transactional and if it's not doing it for you anymore, you give it up. <laughs> or it's only people you're attracted to. Um, and then when it's not working, I think for actual growth in someone's personality, it has to be a relationship you're stuck with. <laughs> so that's why you see it in marriage, yeah. parenting. Mm -hmm. Church is a place where you should kind of be stuck with each other, right? And it's not all people you necessarily chose. Right. Um, yes, alas, I probably would not have chosen each one of you, but we got, we're stuck together. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, I know. Because um, I think one thing, right, for community to work too, there needs to be a bit of diverse, like, we can't just be all the exact same motives, the exact it'd be same. An echo chamber. Right, it'd be an echo, right? Then you just have some group polarization that goes very awry, which we've kind of seen, right? In the way that our society has, like we start to just group ourselves into people who think the same way and who, right? So I think for community to do the job of precondition is, there has to be enough level of commitment that you stay with it and keep talking when the person hurts your feelings <laughs> or when you get something that, ooh, that didn't make me feel good about that myself. So you see that in workplaces because you're sometimes stuck with your boss for a while, but not always. I mean, people, everyone's quit during COVID, right? I mean, I think, and that's something I would look at after COVID in particular, that's a little concerning. And I've seen some interesting articles. I think they had a piece on this in the Atlantic, like, mm -hmm. Should you just drop all these friendships that aren't meaningful to you anymore? And what does, right, how are we approaching our social relationships? Is it all about me and my, what I'm getting out of it? Or do we see our social, our community as actually something bigger than myself? And that the goal is actually not just my personal edification, I think is something, particular moment that's a real issue. Yeah, and coming up with that, uh, I believe that the Enneagram could be useful in just helping us, especially with younger people, helping think about the idea of different perspectives. We've had a sharp drop off in empathy um, in our culture. And so thinking about the fact that our perspective and how we see things and how we frame things may just be one nuance of many, especially because in Enneagram, we're not necessarily looking at hierarchies of numbers, one's good, one's bad. It's, it's the idea of just thinking about like, this could be a different perspective. So it could be useful in how we are thinking about community and, and thinking mm -hmm. about the differences and the different ways people come and are, are framing something that, uh, that we, we can't necessarily qualify as right, wrong, good, bad as a way to open dialogue. Yeah, I think the only thing I would add is um, it has, the Enneagram particularly has taught me to ask questions. Mm -hmm. You know, um, when my first response might have initially been to make a statement, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah. To be curious. Mm -hmm. And I've learned that from other things as well, but, um, but the curiosity factor, I think, is really important as we think about re-engaging our communities, starting small, is um, getting to know each other again, mm -hmm. right? Who are you today? Who have you who have you turned into in the last two years and and how has that been hard and how has that been gratifying and what what have you loved and what have you missed mm -hmm. um there's a, we can find a lot more in common than i think we're ready for mm -hmm. when we get curious about each other indeed mm -hmm. yeah well and we've all been through a true trauma right and so yeah. now is a time when we could really use that empathy because none of us have had a great last two years, I would guess. I mean, maybe someone's been lucky. Might have been that. fabulous. Yeah. <laughs> Good for you. You lack any empathy for us. <laughs> uh, Alan, yeah. So, um, coming, but coming from the perspective of knowing very little about the Enneagram mm -hmm. and listening to this more of an informative way, so I feel like as you were speaking about it, I've been Enneagrammed by people. Yes, I'm <laughs> sure you have. Oh, what number are you? It is and certainly a verb, I, yes. You know, and so you're like, wait, I don't understand the context of where you're even coming from, so you're trying to define me yeah. by this thing. And, and here's some self-discovery that I have been going through with a therapist and uh, the clergy people at the same time. Mm -hmm. I've kind of figured out in this time of COVID, like I want parameters to live within. Mm -hmm. I want 
constraints and I want definitions. Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure I fit inside of them. Mm -hmm. Like, so I think where the, maybe the black person says, wait, we don't do this. Mm -hmm. um, being a gay male, mm -hmm. living in Waco, Texas, all your life, going to Baylor, the primary concern is, do I even fit in with the company that I keep? Am mm -hmm. I even valid? Or am I not? And being able to grow in personality, in spirituality, to even, like I was talking with one of our rectors today, our, our, our associate rector today, and I was like, you know, did, I hope I never lose the wonder of walking into a church and mm -hmm. feeling like I can just be me. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. Not everyone agreeing, not everyone disagreeing, but it, so I don't know whether Enneagram fits with the ability to change relationally over time because one of the hard work that I've had to do is to allow other people to be a, not coming from a defensive position of am I safe? Mm -hmm. And that becomes subconscious. Mm -hmm. Like I don't realize that I'm walking in with guard up and then I, you throw fishing lines out to make sure that it's okay. And once they buy then you're okay, now we kind of become this. I don't know what that makes you because I feel like in some form I'm a challenger and I'm a reformer. And in other ways, I, my biggest, you know, I'm also in a 12 step recovery program. I mean, the big book of, uh, of one thing says, driven by a hundred forms of fear and delusion. Like, my fears can drive me to such a deep level that it becomes the primary fear is the fear of not being liked. Mm -hmm. I just want to be liked. And so how does the Enneagram, when you take people from traumatic situations mm -hmm. or lifelong fear, I think it boxes, it feels like it boxes in and it's got to be defined and it's so much bigger. So does it know. feel good when people Enneagram you? What's the, like, what's the vibe you get when you get asked, you know, what number are you? What's your Enneagram? Just, I, I feel like I want to say, just ask me what you want to know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So it's almost, so. Stop trying to figure yeah, me out. Yeah, circumvent just, it. Just ask me. Yeah. Get to know the me. hard work yeah. of getting to know an yeah. individual yeah, without a stereotype. Exactly, yeah. Two black, black, black people will see my ring and go, are, are, you're married? <laughs> and I'm like, do you want me to answer that question honestly, or do you need one that will make you feel okay yeah. when we walk away? Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, because if I say yes, my husband's name is Darren. Yeah. Oh, okay, now we can't be in relation. So if I can hide that, then we can be relational yeah. together. And this, I think, That's, I mean, I think for me, too, this is where also, like, right, how much of your personality, right, is because you have grown up in a culture and existed in a culture that had a problem with those parts of sure. who you are, right? And would you have a would you have this challenging aspect if you grew up in I don't know, isolate like where right, where we have different and I think that's where right, what fears we have, right, all these things are very much we tend and I right, my big fear, especially with the white women doing a neogram is saying that I was born with it. Like mm -hmm. this is my intrinsic nature. And don't get me wrong. We are born with genetic predispositions for personality. Like your extroversion, about 50% of the variance in this room is explained by genetic. Like I'm not, there is a genetic influence, but not translatable to these types. Like it's, it's on other things. <laughs> and then once you look at how a person in the context, you start to see how that shakes out. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, right, that is, and I think that's my concern with this too, of like, is it a weapon? Like, whenever I do a lot of research on virtues and how do we cultivate virtues right. and how do we do that intentionally, non-intentionally, right? And with that research as well, I'm always trying to clarify, like, this is not a weapon to be used against minorities. Like, you just need to become more virtuous and then you'll be fine. Like, no, this is really about changing the context. <laughs> just as much as the person needing to change is often what needs to happen. It's, it's not just me 
going and reaching community, but my community changing to fit me. And I think we have a role as a body of Christ to do that, to say, are all of our members feeling like they belong? <laughs> How do we need to do things differently to make sure that we aren't, I mean, right? Are we starting communion with the people? We should be like, that is not the individual's job to fix. That is the community's job to fix. I love what you said about sanctification. Yeah. Because sanctification has always felt like to me something that you could could achieve and right. then you've walked you've crossed the finish line. What does it mean to be sanctified? And who is sanctified and who isn't? Who gets to define that? Not me. Because that's <laughs> like, 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 like I'm both just God, that it's just the confession. Right. Like it's like right. yo, what? Well, and interestingly, on the spirituality side, the churches who frequently confess tend not to be the ones with the Enneagram workshops, which, yeah. just a note, in general, <laughs> yeah. like, if when I was looking at churches in town, they were not the liturgical types, more generally, that would do it. So there is something, got to bring theology, there is something theological in our assumptions about who we are to become that translates from the tools we use, mm -hmm. and that's not entirely true, right? An Anglican sees the, sees the Enneagram yeah. as helpful. Mm -hmm. But in general, they do seem to bear on each other about how we view the work of sanctification. Sure, and I was gonna say, thank you for sharing yourself mm -hmm. here with us today. Mm -hmm. And um, and uh, in all the ways that you've described, just your, yourself and your process, I think it's worth noting that um, while I don't think the Enneagram is going to be the tool that accomplishes that, that no ability when it comes to the safety and community, especially when we're thinking about trauma, there's nothing about the Enneagram that replaces trauma-informed mm -hmm. psychology. So, so these are just separate categories that, again, we need to just keep in the right boxes. Mm -hmm. um, I will say though that I believe that the Enneagram and how I've been able to use it in my life has made me a safer person for the people around me. So if there's any one way that I could say that it is it has worked is because again, my lack of self-awareness wasn't helping me, wasn't helping the people around me, wasn't helping the people in these spaces. And so creating a higher level of empathy, creating a posture to ask more questions, to ask more questions about the, the things that are about to come out of my mouth <laughs> that I'm wanting to put back right yep. and, and to to build that and yeah no one should be coming up and be like mm, you look like a, a four to me like no one no one should be should be typing just whether it's the Enneagram or anything right caricatures stereotypes none of these are valuable avenues to intimacy and relationships but for again, for, for folks who have used the Enneagram, it became a viable shorthand to me, especially with the 15 students that I was working with every day as a way to just sort of grease the wheels of us actually getting to know each other, not in place of getting to know each other, not to caricature or type each other, but as a way to get closer to that deeper level of knowing, which the Enneagram is only helpful as much as it is helpful and then it is not. Yeah. And so again, I, I think it is helpful, but... It's been helpful for me. It's been super helpful for me. And I believe I've grown as a person by the grace of God and tools that don't really fit necessarily into the things I learned in seminary, but like family systems theory has been incredibly valuable to me. Uh, Enneagram has been valuable to me, but these things are sort of tools in the fields that, that they live in. Um, and I would not want to try to use them in a way that they are not fit. So I think the question when people come and say, oh, do you know your number? It could be a genuine desire to know you. Um, and it could be someone being a total jerk. So one way or another, I just, I just feel like we have to be discerning and careful, especially if we're not sure that that person is safe yet. Can I add one thing? Um, I think to in personality science, right? We want to uh, one of the most important things, right? You have like personality traits, you have like habits and strategy, like more dynamic interaction. But something that we also research is people's narrative identities. <laughs> that there's, if we really want to get to know you, I'd ask you to tell me your story, right? Mm -hmm. That's 
<laughs> right, I mean, but right, that would be, because all those other pieces would start to come out. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I think that's something, I think normally we connect best when we tell each other our stories mm -hmm. yeah. and also relate our story to the story, <laughs> this, right. the kingdom of God story right. and Christ story. Like, so I think that, and even within the scientific community, there's always this like, let's do the easy stuff of the trait. Like the story is messy, but there's information that you get the way someone tells their story what event, like the feet, like that you just cannot get any other way. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I always, I'm like, you can't really go wrong when you start telling <laughs> stories. Yeah. And I mean, there's a whole narrative therapy, like yeah. what is this story and how do I keep telling? And we don't tell our stories alone. They're always yeah. in community. Mm -hmm. Well, in asking someone their story, you realize you're asking something of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whereas asking someone's number almost feels too easy. It's objective. Like, like, you don't self, get it that easy. You don't get, yeah. Because if some stranger, if one of my students came up to me and said, tell me your story, I'd be like, excuse me? Yep. Like, yeah. that would not be an appropriate mm -hmm. boundary thing to do in that moment. Whereas asking the number can be the same kind of self-disclosure. Yeah. But it's like somehow... It's coded. Yeah, it's yeah. a very strange boundary transgression mm -hmm. that it appears really in a pl on a place like Baylor campus a really normal thing. Mm -hmm. Where in the chaplain's office it might be appropriate, in the classroom, mm -hmm. might not with your brand new roommate might not be <laughs> the most appropriate thing. Like just today, I had a student come into my office. She was on my search committee. She's a she's a Baylor grad. She heard me mention that I was an Enneagram 8 as it came up for in context for question about leadership style. And she came in and she said, I'm also an Enneagram 8. And it, not a lot of us as women tend to be Enneagram 8s because culturally we're sort of punished for the sorts of traits that tend to be associated with that number. Um, and she felt a certain safety coming and talking to me and opening up to me about her own struggles with some of those personality traits that she identifies with with the eight as well and knowing that about me opened my door for mm -hmm. her but then we got to know each other's stories there was there was a that was sort of a launching pad a threshold for us to be able to move deeper in and so i began to ask her like tell me how this how this has helped you where where in your story has this worked for you like mm -hmm. give me some more information and so that that just happened a few mm -hmm. hours before this yeah. panel and so it I, I believe there's something to the shorthand i believe there's something to the shorthand can like can this be weaponized absolutely just like anything and we have to be so careful and i think we need to take the recommendations of very smart people who are saying careful this could be bad um but in again, it, that 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 gateway, that primer, that that open door, it gave her a moment to come and be herself, simply because she heard that during my interview. All right. Any final words before I wrap? So, if you are interested in the co-written Christianity Today article. <laughs> Maybe they shouldn't be on video. If you email me, <laughs> which my card is right by the door, I can send it to you. Yeah. Um, if you're a Baylor student, you get it for free anyway. Yeah. If not, whatever. Copyright people can come after me. Come at me. Come, um, come at me. But uh, a couple, just a couple things. Uh, one, this event has been co-hosted by St. Albans and the Episcopal Student Center. But the Episcopal Student Center is currently in the midst of transition, so please pray for the next priest call to this place and these students, um, because we are in the midst of that decision now. I know most of you have a church home, but if you do not, or you want to learn more about liturgical churches, I do have a bit of information about St. Albans. I also have stickers and uh, magnets, because we love swag at St. Albans. And if you want to receive any emails about events like this, you can sign up there. There are also other wonderful churches in town. 
Um, I have no swag. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we are. We are working on the swag. swag. We are chronically into swag and saying all this. Yeah, like there's, yeah. it's a little, it's a little overboard maybe, but <laughs> we also have more swag if you come on a Sunday. Yeah. Um, we have all kinds of swag. I'm gonna have to like sneak your swag game. Yeah. No, yeah. you could just. I'll give you a tour of our swag. Oh, okay. We have tote bags. <laughs> we have all kinds of swag. Um, but on that note, Sam, would you pray for us as we close out tonight? I would be glad to. The Lord be with you. Oh, with you. you. Let us pray. God, as we come to the end of this day, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for the gift of this time together, for all that you have laid before us today. And as we prepare for rest, we give you particular thanks for the unique and loving ways that you made each of us and the ways that you have helped us be known in our communities and the ways that we have known you in our communities. We ask your courage and your comfort as we continue to discover who we are, made in your likeness, in your image. And as we prepare for rest, we ask you to take hold of all those things that bring us anxiety, that cause us fear, that make us uncertain. We ask you to take them, to cover them in your care, in your kindness, so that we might rest free and wake up in the loving embrace of your arms. In Christ's holy name we pray. Mm -hmm. Amen. And thank you, Pamela. Yeah, yeah. <laughs>